Hi, hello everyone. Um, today I'm here with one of the authors, Agrima Sharma, for the um, article Partnering Up, including managers as research partners in systematic reviews in the April um, 2023 issue of Organizational Research Methods. So I just want to say welcome, Agrima. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for having me here. Great. So what I would like to discuss with you a little bit more is, um, first, today we're going to talk a little bit more about the background story of the paper and further thoughts from you, the author, to really take this research forward. Um, so what motivated you to investigate how managers can be included in this systematic reviews, you know, thus addressing kind of that research uh, practice gap you spoke of, and really um, achieving those timely and robust findings that this the team you described was able to do. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge also my co-author, Chima Bansal, who played a big role in sort of, you know, uh, framing uh, the paper and actually providing access to the data. So um, I uh, I am a confident, I say it for both of us, that both of us are really interested in this idea of research impact, you know, and how can our uh, research, our knowledge generation can actually change practice, practice of management management, practice of leadership, practice of just sort of outside of academia. <clears throat> so that was sort of the overarching motivation. And just going all the way back to how the paper started, um, I was a postdoctoral fellow at um, Network for Business Sustainability, which is housed in Ivy Business School in um, Ontario, Canada. And I'm just gonna use the acronym NBS for that uh, organization. So NBS is a nonprofit housed, like I said, in the business school. And what they did, and which is also, I uh, take a minute to explain it because that's also the context of the data that we collected for this paper. So what NBS did is that they brought managers and researchers together to use the systematic review process or method across a period of almost a year. And they answered sort of a specific a question around, let's say, stakeholder collaboration or sustainability culture and so forth, the topic related to sustainability. So they brought managers and researchers together and they embarked on this quite a challenging uh, journey of about <clears throat> six to eight months or a, almost sometimes a year in which they went through each step of the systematic review process. So for those listening, if you under, if you know the systematic review process, it's very well laid out. The method is very well laid out. And then just imagine overlaying sort of um, practitioner, manager inputs at each part or each step of the method. So, so I was sort of witnessing that in real time uh, at NBS and so started collecting data around that. And that's how uh, sort of this paper emerged. Again, the big motivation was, you know, how can we change some of our research practice to get it closer to um, closer to, uh, you know, making an impact. And also, you know, if you think about systematic reviews in general, they're, you know, they're part of what's called the overarching evidence-based management movement, but it's not clear whether despite that connection to evidence-based management, whether systematic reviews have really created an impact. So that was another motivation, and that's the framing we start with in the paper that how can we get systematic reviews closer to impact. Yes, I really enjoyed one to see this great collaboration with your co-author that you could see throughout and um, also that innovative setting of um, the, the, the group um, and how they were to address this and hopefully it'll inspire the other universities to take on these type of um, collaborations as well. Uh, so my, my second question is what are the two key takeaways you want researchers to walk away with from this paper? Um, so, so again, going back to sort of the motivation, uh, you know, in the paper and over the, across the review process, uh, what we realized is that, you know, um, what we can offer of most value is concrete practices that researchers can sort of, um, 
embrace and use in their own work. And so one of the key takeaways I hope that people uh, take from this paper is that, you know, when we think about rigor and when we think about relevance, we always start with this place of tensions and saying that the two worlds are very different and it's hard to imbricate them. And it's um, it's a valid uh frame to look at the uh, issue, but we, I hope our paper shows that, you know, practices can circumvent or maybe even transcend uh, some of those divides and tensions. So if you look at the long table one, that the long table one that we have in our paper, um, you know, we sort of offer that we offer the, uh, you know, um, tensions, but most importantly, we offer several practices in the in the last column that anybody can really um, include in their own work. Um, and so, for example, just give you an example, or a little taste of what that looks like. One of the practices we saw that could transcend some of the tensions we were seeing between research and practice communities working together was that instead of um, text or language that is very specific to each community, you bring in visuals or objects or images that can actually transcend that divide of text or language. And in that table, we describe how in our particular context, visuals were used to work across the divide. So Again, one takeaway is that rigor and relevance can be imbricated. And in that table, we offer several practices on how you can do that. Um, and then the second piece is that, you know, even though our focus is on systematic reviews, um, you know, if you read the paper, uh, you know, it, it can be, it, it take a step back and abstract out of it. Some of the key insights, again, the practices are really relevant for opening this kind of, uh, or opening a research process to any method we apply, you know, whether it be um, quantitative or interpretive or any other way that we collect data. And so this kind of collaboration, in other words, we call it co-creation. So this kind of co-creative collaboration is really sort of this worldview or logic, you know, and so our practices are pretty, um, you know, trans transferable across uh, various research methods. And so I just want to sort of invite a broader audience beyond those interested in systematic review to sort of engage with the kind of practices we've identified and sort of uh, experiment with how they can, um, how you can update your own research uh, approach to get closer to impact in that way. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I do agree you're the way you lay out and all your recommendations could apply to any um, any type of method as far as quantitative or various qualitative ones. And um, I was really impressed with how when you applied this, this, when they were working through these tensions, you had some really innovative ideas come out, like the manager who brought in the uh, the job descriptions to argue for organizational level of this of this concept. So it's really kind of shaking things up back and forth. And then also how the researchers, how they approached um, with imagery on these frameworks saying that these are some things we're still, we're still um, in development. So it gave space for the managers and how that can translate across a variety of uh, different research questions we have. So. Those were some of the really wonderful uh, things I could see translated. Um, so third, in your writing process, were there any surprises or issues that came up? So one, uh, one sort of pleasant surprise, <laughs> so to say, was just the traction, you know, the idea got with the, so this is a part of a special issue in ORM. The special issue is about um, impactful literature reviews and the idea of that impactful can be usually is all quite narrow in the sense of impact on academia. And here we were sort of um, asking to expand that and talking about impactful in the sense of impacting the practice of uh, management and organizations. So, um, so you know, it's a it's a sort of a, a little bit of risk uh, taking, but you know, this uh, editors were really supportive. And I just want to mention Jean Bart 
cartooning, especially, you know, she's done such wonderful work in the area of research impact and just getting that support and guidance and shepherding from editors. It was sort of a pleasant surprise. And I also mentioned that for those of um, those listening who may be earlier in their career, you know, we always hear of sort of um, um, what's the right word, like horror stories of the review process. So, but there is, you know, often if you get the right sort of a review team, it can be a pleasant, you know, generative process. So that was a, that was a sort of a pleasant surprise. Um, the other was, um, again, you know, this is an issue that I continue to grapple with in my work, you know, we were talking about impactful, but uh, the editors were quick and the review team was quick to point out that we have no really concrete um, explanation and evidence of research impact in our own like data and paper. And they nudged us a uh, quite a fair bit to show, you know, um, what impact can look like. And there was a little bit of discomfort on at our end in terms of really sort of quantifying or, um, you know, drawing a boundaries around this notion of impact. Um, it was more like an analytical sort of trope rather than anything else, because over time, you know, we realize that impact is processual, you know, sort of impact is every time we show up as researchers, we're sort of impacting the context and the way we show up and it's relational and it's recursive. And how do you show all of that in terms of, you know, sort of these uh, data bytes? So, uh, so the review team continued to nudge us. So in the end, Again, in the paper, you will see that we have a table in which we've tried to move closer to impact in terms of number of downloads, in terms of anecdotes and so on and so forth of how um, the, the uh, outputs generated out of these collaborations were used in practice, but we really, you know, also end the paper and the discussion saying that impact is rather elusive in the sense that we have to sort of rethink how we consider research impact. And some of my own future work with Tima and others are trying to unpack that, but just sort of that nudge toward uh, making clear what impact looks like was quite a learning experience, yeah. Um, I was really impressed with when you discussed how the managers um, accrued their knowledge. And it was through those experiences, very contextual. And so to me, it's also you're describing your impact is those contextual experiences <laughs> with these managers and how it influences the way that they understand things. In addition, you discussed how it influenced the researchers and how they approach topics. But I wonder if that was maybe some of the part you were having a hard time quantifying um, linking it together. Yeah, definitely. You're right. You're picking on a, something that I didn't say is that we also have uh, impact in terms of how did it change? How did the process change me as a researcher? And how did the process change the managers? And, you know, how do you really sort of uh, uh, show that, you know, in, in this tight uh, setting? And we tried to do that, but it's sort of an ongoing endeavor to understand fully what research impact really means. Yeah, and you know, some of the, sorry, sorry. To just no, one, go ahead. One last thing that I want to also, you know, food for thought, offer to other people who are interested in unpacking this puzzle of research impact is that, you know, some again, something with this group of co-authors that I've been trying to uh, write about is sort of the shift from impact to impacting, right? So impact is not this one shot event. It's again, this process that we continuously engage in and what we do, you know, we need to sort of be intentional and aware of that process as researcher if we want to sort of uh, want our work to matter. I just heard a second paper you described <laughs> that you might be writing. Um, so was there anything else um, that maybe came through the review process, something you had to change or any other additional insights? You mentioned a lot already, but maybe any other internal discussions? So one of the other thing that I thought was really interesting is that, you know, this was my first time publishing in ORM and, you know, definitely I'm going to sort of see it as journal of choice or, you know, for my own work going forward, because it's such an interesting journal, because, you know, we were 
if you read the papers and including our own process, you know, this embeddedness in theory and data is important. But also, you know, we were so uh, fully encouraged to how does all of that integrates with practice and in, in our case, practice of research, you know, um, and um, and I just found that so refreshing, <laughs> you know, because often we do all of our work and sort of the implications um, are almost an afterthought, you know, but uh, we, at least this group of special issue editors that we worked with really wanted us to show that interconnection between theory data and then implications for practice of research. And how I hope that has sort of come, up, come out clearly in the paper. Um, the other thing that, again, going back to Jean Bartunik and her own work on sort of this decades of work she's done, she rightly reminds us oftentimes that, you know, we, because we understand the world of research, our focus is so much on researcher in terms of their implications, in terms of how they show up. And then she kept asking, what about the managers? You know, what about implications for them? What about their world? What about their experiences? And so she saw this lopsided treatment <laughs> of the two communities and she was quick to point it out. And I'm glad she did. And, you know, so we were careful that we are talking about this space, this practices of two communities, and not simply just talking about sort of what researchers should do. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that the uh, review team was also really, um, you know, encouraging rightly. So in terms of asking us, what are the disadvantages of such process and maybe better framed as sort of what are the boundary conditions? And so I'll just say one quick one um, is that our, all of our projects, the 15 that we studied, are, were focused on sustainability and this is sort of uh, an empirical question that whether collaboration between research and practice is um, relatively uh, easier or lends itself better to sustainability questions because it's a, it's a collective goal that, you know, if all of us want to save Earth or mitigate climate change, it's sort of a collective goal we can get behind. And what would that look like if it's a non-sustainability context? So we try to describe that a little bit in terms of boundary conditions. But again, that was, I'm glad that that was brought into, uh, you know, the discussion in the review process and within our own, between team and I. Right. Um, so or what would be your vision, being an idealist, where would you see your work influence future research? You mentioned a little bit of that and how it can be applied in these different contexts, but could you go into it further? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so so this, the, uh, this paper sort of follows on for a paper that we wrote at Academy of Management Journal in which we theorize more around, you know, rigor relevance imbrication. And so this paper was our follow on in the sense of, okay, that's great theorizing, but what do we do, right? So it's, again, you ask, uh, you would propose a great frame being an idealist, because I feel like what Tima and I in many cases are that idealist in terms of, you know, how do we update research practice in academia, right? So that was our goal in the sense that you know, take this work forward in terms of how do you do it. So, so when you ask how does this paper influence future research, I think my a simple answer is that if people actually sort of learn from these practices that we've listed and interrogate within their own research practices, what can they change, how they can update, how can they organize their own uh, research practice collaboration, to me, that would be really achieving the vision of what we started with, you know, in this work. And to that, to that goal, um, we've, uh, we've created a blog post, we've created a video, we've created an infographic, which is sort of a cheat sheet of how researchers can really take some of these practices into their own world. We do a lot of talking around it in many spaces, such as this and other spaces where we invited to word, just helping researchers reflect on what is that one thing or two thing or project design or research design or research agenda that I can up 
update, you know, in drawing from this our work in this paper that can get us closer to research impact. So that would that is our vision. Yeah. That's wonderful. I think it's really inspiring that you took this risk and that it was supported in the academic community and that it kind of gives space now for future researchers to also engage. Um, so lastly, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to add? Um, I think we had, uh, we spoke about everything that I really wanted to say for now, I guess, um, uh, you know, the only other thing I'll say is that uh, there's so much discussion on research impact right now, at least in my little impact bubble of scholarship that I hang out with, and uh, there's quite a bit going on, and sometimes it can seem so um, hard to do. You know, a lot of discussion on research impact really begins in this gap and tensions and, you know, challenges and, you know, none of our incentive systems in academia support that. Um, but one thing that I want to sort of call to action, food for thought, is that, you know, every sort of step matters. Um, and, you know, I have a really great colleague at American Ron Hill. He does amazing work in prisons and homeless populations, so on and so forth. And, you know, he has this framing around ethnography where he says that um, I show up in my research context asking what can I give and not simply mm. what can I do. You know, so even that little shift from give to take, I think, can really change uh, the meaningfulness of our work. So, so I guess what I the final thought or one thing or one thesis <laughs> out of our conversation that I want to leave our listener, you know, whoever listens to this mm -hmm. with is that I think ev like every little sort of step or you know practice or change uh you know with intention for impact that we show up in in a research context every micro action would matter so um so i hope that all of us sort of are, are reflexive about how we are doing our research in the context of impact that is a wonderful way to think about it it really challenged me when i was reading through and how i was going to approach research um so i just want to say thank you for your time and and your and Tina's LA hard work explaining these tensions and how to address them so that managers and research can uh, better collaborate to conduct meaningful and timely reviews that impact both of our fields, right? To get that rigor and relevance at the same time. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Elizabeth, and uh, what a great set of questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>